My name is Dean. I'm a person in long-term recovery. And what that means to me is since July 7th of 2007, I haven't used any alcohol or drugs. And because of that, I've been able to become a productive member of society. I've been able to become the dad to a beautiful little boy. I've been able to become the son to my parents that they always knew before I started using. Um, I'd be able to have a sense of peace. And I've got this show inside addiction. My guest today is Jet. Jet, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. So Jet, let's start out with, tell me how it was growing up. Growing up, I mean, looking back, it seemed pretty normal, you know. I, I think I was pretty normal. My family was pretty normal. It was, um, you know, we went to church on Sundays and had family dinners and all that good stuff. I mean, obviously it wasn't always sunshine and rainbows or anything, but what family really is, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I don't really remember a whole, a whole lot of alcohol use around, around me, at least as a child. I mean, there was obviously some, but you know, not that really affecting me at that age. I don't think, I don't think. And then, you know, it was, I had a lot of siblings. So there was, at one point there was like eight of us kids living in a house with my mom and my stepdad. So. Wow. So we all we all got along quite nice most of the time. Most of the time. Yeah, but like, yeah. you know, it was it was it was. I had a good upbringing overall. I had a very good upbringing. I was always in school. I was you know I was always told to do my homework and all that stuff. Whether or not I was throwing temper tantrum, I still had to do it. That kind of thing. And uh, we always had food on the table. I always had a roof over my head, clothes on my back. You know. So did you grow up in a, a small town, big city. Small town, Socrates. Real small town. Real small town. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, everybody knows each other kind of thing. Everybody knows what everybody's up to. Right. <laughs> so how were your grades in school? School was okay? I did well. I did well. Yeah. I, I didn't, I mean, I wouldn't say school was my favorite thing to do, but I, I did it. I did it well to, for the most part. Math was a little iffy, but still is. It's okay. <laughs> so tell me about um, the first time that you used any substances. I have to say... I'm, I'm pretty sure it was 14. I started smoking pot really right, right around 14. How'd you get, how'd you get introduced to, to weed? My friends, my friends. I mean, I, I knew about it. Um, I know that there was probably certain members of my family that were using it, but it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. You know, like it was always made to seem very normal. Right. You know, and not that I was ever urged to, to smoke as a kid or anything, but it just wasn't a big deal. You know, it's just, it was just weed. It's just weed. Kind of thing. <laughs> and so like I was, a lot of my friends started to turn out to be much older than I was. Not much older. I'd say like if I was 14, I think the oldest friend I had was like 20, 21, mm -hmm. which I guess is sort of a big difference. But at the same time, it, we all were doing the same thing and we all got along really well. It's in the same music. We all hung out and smoked pot. I used to be one of the ones that was like, I don't smoke pot, guys. And like, I leave the room when they were going to. And then I don't know what happened one day. One day you didn't leave the room. They didn't leave the room. <laughs> So it seemed like fun, you know, like it was, it was a good way to sit down with everybody and connect and laugh and listen to music and like, it, you know, for, for most people it's harmless, you know, and for myself it didn't, it was harmless until it wasn't kind yeah. of thing, you know. So at 14 years old, what grade were you in? Seventh, I think. Seventh, so did it, seventh or eighth grade, was yeah. it something you just did like a weekend warrior or you did it one time or? I did it one time and then kept doing it. You know, it wasn't like I'm just. Well, everybody does it one time, <laughs> and then you do it another time, yeah, and, and I, another I just, time. I just kept doing it. I never really took a break. You know, like it was like I, I got in, I got into it. I realized how much more at ease I felt. I felt comfortable. I could kind of like be me, so to speak. But did you have a hard time being you prior to smoking weed at age 14, or was I, there something in particular that, that made it difficult for you to be yourself at that age? I other was, than any other thing that makes it hard for a 14-year-old. <laughs> to be 14. To, yeah, to, that was the problem. The whole problem was I was 14. Yeah. But um, I did have, I was in counseling a little bit here and there and throughout, like, early early high school. I had, like, anger management type situations. And uh, I'm not sure where it came from, but I know it was a lot of low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. I used to be in the counselor's office almost daily for, like, you know, like, cutting my wrists and things like that. It wasn't anything super serious in my opinion. But, like, it did worry my parents. It worried the counselors. And so, like... You know, I used to get mad at them for like having to call my parents right. or like whatever. But I, you know, obviously hindsight being twenty twenty, they had to do what they had to do to, to do their job. Sure. And they were worried about me, so I, I started trying out um, depression medications. I was put on Zoloft for a small while. I don't feel like it worked very well. 
I mean, I also couldn't, I don't ever felt I was taking enough kind of thing. I was like, it's just not working. It's just, it's just not working. So like I was, I wouldn't say I was depressed as a kid. I didn't remember feeling like that awfulness, but I was, I was, I would say down and out a lot. Like I would do a lot of like drawing and like the drawing wasn't the happiest drawing and I would do a lot of writing and the writing was not the happiest writing. And so I'm not sure what the problem really was. Like I said, like my, my home life was good. Sure. It was good. But so I, did, did marijuana help you with your depression? Was it something that, you know, not only socially, but did it also assist in like a self-medicating? Absolutely. That's like, looking back now, I can see that's what I was doing. You know, like I would, I would end up smoking and then I'd be like, well, and everything's all gone. Kind it's of all thing. good. You know, it's, it's all good. <laughs> everything's fine. Yep. You know, and that was, I don't know. I don't, um, it was definitely an escape. It was definitely an escape. It was it was just a sense of ease and comfort. It was ease and comfort, you know, and everybody was all good. So ease and comfort, was there any negative impact or side effects at, at 14 years old smoking weed? Like with school, with your, your, cause this sounds like, you, like you said, your family life, your home life was pretty, pretty good. Pretty good. So did it have any negative impacts at, at that age? Well, I wasn't living at home anymore. I had moved in with a friend of mine. At 14? At 14. Okay. Yeah, it was just certain family situations just led to me staying with them. I was closer to school. My sure. mom ended up having to move and she was further away and she didn't want to take me out of high school. And so I ended up staying there. And I mean, it wasn't anything having to do with that household. Either. That house was great. You know, yeah. everything was good there. It was just, um, I don't remember, not, not to put like, you know, sunshine on weed or anything because I know how it affects me now. But it didn't have a whole lot of negative impacts. I can, aside from like, you know, eating a lot or like wasting my money. Like I definitely started spending money on it a lot. And like, right. you know, I did have a job at 14. So wow. I was like, yep, got that money. So like, that's what I was using it for. It was like either like weed or like, you know, things that I wanted to do at 14 years old. So I don't, the only negative impact I can say it had was eventually it became not enough. I just couldn't smoke enough to get to where I wanted to be. Right. And like, that's me what, from what I've learned now. Like, I didn't obviously didn't see that from before as it sure. was just like a, like, yeah, it can be one of those gateway drugs. Same thing with alcohol though. Like that was the same thing. I wouldn't, I don't think I would have done half the things that I did prescription pill wise and all of that without having tried weed or alcohol first. So you went from weed at 14. At what point it sounds like you went to alcohol or, or prescription pills first after that? Probably all at the same time. Okay. So I was a mixer. I mixed them. Okay, <laughs> so uh, from the age of 14, how long did it take before your, you know, your use kind of progressed and you got to that point where you said, hey, it, it was never enough at that point, you couldn't smoke enough. So then you moved on to what? Drinking, drinking and prescription medications. And how old were you when you started drinking? 15. 15, so within a year. Within a year. Within a year, it was like, this is not working anymore. I may have dabbled a little bit in alcohol before then, but like the first time I remember it was, was a pretty awful blackout when I was mixing alcohol with another medication. So, so you were still on prescription medication? It was someone else's. It was prescription it, medication. It, was prescription. it just wasn't yours. It wasn't mine. Or it, was a so, it was a prescription medication. It was a prescription. It wasn't mine. So tell me about the, the surrounding circumstances with the first time you drank at 15 years old, you know, how, you know, how it all came about. And it sounds like right off the rip, it wasn't a very good experience. So tell me about that. It wasn't a very good experience. Um, I don't, there was nothing wrong. I we were just hanging out and having a good time. We're at a, a friend of mine's house and um, it was, I think it was screwdrivers, screwdrivers and I think Ativan, I'm not going to lie. Screwdrivers and Ativan and the next thing I know, I had, I had downed it because I, I don't know, I was always like, I, I would chug things so I would drink it real quick because it tasted good Yeah. and it made me feel warm and nice and comfortable and the next thing I know I was in a shower because I had blacked out and like probably just really sick. At 15 really years sick. old, you were blacking out. Absolutely. <laughs> so I'm, I'm guessing that scared the hell out of you and you never drank again. False. No, I was like, ah, okay, I just did it wrong. Like, you know, I just did it too quick or like I just You got to drink slower. The, the problem is I, I chugged it with Ativan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not really sure where the idea came to mix things from. It was just like I thought if I just took one of these and like a little bit of this, it would be fine. And like for a little while, I think it was, but I really couldn't. I don't remember the rest of the night, honestly. So a few friends of mine probably do, because because they, they they genuinely saved my ass that night. But so smoking weed at fourteen, starting to drink and mix with pills at fifteen, mm -hmm. black out the first time you drink. Do you black out every time after that? 
don't tell me you don't remember because clearly then you blacked out. <laughs> Most of I'd say a good 90% of the time, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I was just, because I never, I just didn't, I didn't know how to stop. Right. I didn't, I didn't want to stop. I mean, why would I stop? You know, like everybody else was going, like I was one of the ones who had a whole lot of pride and I was like, I can drink anyone at the table, but I was usually the first one to. Under the table. Be, be, be throwing up somewhere or, you know, it's. That was just, I just always went hard. And like the weed, did it get to a point that there just wasn't enough with alcohol too? There was just never enough, really. I would combine all of them all the time. There was know? just never enough in general. There was never enough, you know, and it was only enough until I ended up falling asleep and I would wake up and probably do it all over again. Like usually I would put one of those timestamps on it where either I was going to do it right after school. Right. But I was using in school, again, you know, let's be honest, that was... It was either we'd like take our lunch and like we'd all you just had the liquid go somewhere, lunch. <laughs> go liquid somewhere lunch. and like either I never drank much in school. That that is a fact. I didn't drink much in school, but I was always getting high in school. Right. So at this point, uh, fifteen years old, year after you started using, you're using in school. At this point, did it have a profound effect on your life? Grades? Anything? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. I don't know. I'm not going to say that I had control of it or anything, but I think I just knew that I didn't want to mess up school. You know right. What I mean, like my grades were on it and they still are like very important to me. Like I just, I wanted to do well in school. And then I ended up learning that there was um, prescription medications you can take that would just help you stay awake and like do, do a lot of schoolwork. And, you know, and if it wasn't schoolwork, it would be like I could at least study for a long period of time. But I did, I did dedicate a lot of my time to schoolwork. Gotcha. I, it felt no negative stuff yet which is why i think i did as much as i did as often as i did it because it was like well nothing's going wrong so it's all good it's all good until it's not <laughs> until it's not and at some yeah. point it was no longer 17 yeah 17 so 17 it started getting really so it took rough. a couple of years i couldn't i couldn't really tell you much of what i did during like 15 to 17 nothing wow. i don't remember anything i just you know kind of stuff takes a toll on your memory right i know that it was obviously it wasn't all bad because i kept doing it you mm -hmm. know like I was always hanging out with friends and like I'm not saying my friends were negative impact on me like they weren't like I, I made the choices to do what I did sure you know but I mean it didn't necessarily help that we all did the same thing either because I finally felt like I could fit in somewhere like that low self-esteem kind of stuff from from high school kind of gets you so when you find people who accept you I found my place those, those, those are your people man and that's that's what I did I mean the negative stuff didn't start coming until I had my license and started driving because I would keep stuff in my car and like if you get pulled over in your car someone's like we they're gonna search your car and like you know a couple of uh upms and things like that but it was just tickets it was always just a slap on the wrist for for a while and then it was like when 17 hit i got my first kind of like scare so to speak obviously it wasn't enough to scare me to stop but i was like all right i just won't do it that way so like i ended up getting hit with a with a small drug charge for having prescription medication on me that wasn't mine <laughs> So. so that's what happened at 17. Yeah. So tell me about <clears throat> the progression into, hey, uh, I knew I had a problem when. That took, it honestly took a while. Mine, I feel, was, like a, was a, a slower progression uh -huh. than some of the stories I do here. But it was because um, I had that idea where, like, I got it. Like, I'm invincible. If I get caught again, it's just, it's just going to be a slap on the wrist and they're going to let me go. Because another I'm ticket. so young. Yeah, it's yeah. another ticket and, like, no big deal. But it became expensive after a while like I did end up going to outpatient treatment the first time for that first drug charge that I caught they put me in outpatient treatment um I believe I was on a conditional license for that because it was like a I don't remember the, I don't see my memory's a little shot but I don't remember what the charge was but it was still enough to them put me in treatment just because they felt I had a problem with pres prescription medication so right. I was like okay fine so like I had to stop smoking weed for that point in time, which I was able to because they had to drug test you and all of that, and I didn't want to get in any more trouble, so I kind of was able to not do as much so I could get out of trouble. So when things get out of hand? Probably, it didn't, I didn't notice it getting out of hand until maybe like 21, 22, 21, 22, yeah, because like even, even after I had try getting sober for the for like one of the first times it was like people were like oh wow was it that bad and I was like don't say things like that but you know it's it's true like I kind of felt like I had this under control mm -hmm. you know like and I guess I don't even know how to describe like got bad you know like it was a slow progression for me like I didn't really get you know wake hard. up one morning and, and be like oh shit mm -mm. 
No, I'm not over until, my head. Like 23. So 23. 21, 22 became like constant usage. It was like every day and it was. Seven days a week. Yeah. So yeah. T- 23. Mm-hmm. Tell me about it. 23. Um, right. I'm, yeah. Yeah. T- 23 was when I first got, I think probably one of my first DWIs where they actually like took my license away and like I got an, I got an actual DWI charge, DWAI. They were nice enough to drop that one down for me because it was my first actual offense on the, on the record for. That you got caught for. That I got caught for. <laughs> I was officially caught. I was like, all right, I'll just do it better next time. Um, so yeah, I got through court. I paid all of the fines and got my license back. And then I continued to do the same thing. I would drink and drive a lot. Like I'm not, obviously I'm, I've, so lucky that I didn't hurt anybody or myself like that. Yeah. That's kind of what I did. I, like I, I had open containers in my car all the time, and like I just thought it was okay because that's the kind of rational that's the kind of rational thinking I had going on yeah, at that point. That's what we I'd, do, you know. And um, I don't know. I guess twenty three. I got through all of that. I was in college at this point, and um, I was doing well in college. I actually ended up graduating in recovery. But what'd you go to school for? I got an associates in science. Originally, I went for forensic science and realized I was terrible at organic chemistry. And I was like, all right, you know, abort mission. But I, I stayed, you know, I still went for like individual studies. Mm-hmm. But I ended up with an associate's in science. And um, I started abusing Adderall, which apparently is a common college student type thing. Helps you study, helps you stay helps up. Helps you study, helps you stay up, which is what I did. I would pull a few all-nighters and do do all of the things that I had to do to catch up. So that during the day, I could have fun and do what I wanted to do and mm-hmm. like work. And I was going to work at like three in the morning. I worked at a bakery at that time and then I would go to college from like nine sometimes until like eight o'clock at night. And then I would go and do what I wanted to do. Go to the club at night and come back, get chopped off at work after the club. It was just really, it was unmanageable. It was yeah. really, really unmanageable. And so I guess at the point where I had <clears throat> woken up was not until after, um, I had totaled my car. I totaled my car in June or July of 2013. And that was as a result of drinking and driving. And um, that was just, it was just my bad, you know, like I ended up, the substances that I was on ended up wearing off and I fell asleep at the wheel and I crashed into a ditch and tried to tell the cop that it was a deer. He didn't believe me. I didn't get out of that one. But um, it wasn't until two weeks after that where I got caught drinking and driving again. Where I got my last DWI in August. Gotcha. My sober date's in October, so I still hadn't stopped. It wasn't bad enough wasn't bad enough. So you got sober? I did. In October? Yeah, October 23rd, 2013. Awesome. Mm-hmm. So going on four years. Yeah. Yep. Congratulations. Thank you. How did you get sober? I have a very large sober network. I'm, I'm involved a lot with, with certain types of service. And like I have 90% of the people in my life today are sober. They've taught me how to do what I need to do. They've given me, they've shown me what it's like to have fun in sobriety. You know, they've shown me how to be a part of advocating for young people in sobriety and recovery. I, how, did, how did you go from being with a group of people that all do the same things, smoke weed, drink, to a group of people that don't? How did you make that transition? You know, I, had, um, I was at college one day and I was leaving. I was really upset about like, whatever was going on with, with my in, or outpatient treatment at the time. <clears throat> and I met a girl outside who was like, he overheard my phone call and was like, so listen, I was just, I was eavesdropping. I'm like, okay. Um, she asked me if I wanted to go to a, me- a meeting with her. I was like, wow. okay. And I was like, that's really random, but okay. At, at college? At college. Yeah, she was outside college. Just hey, I heard the conversation. Do you want to go to a meeting tonight? <laughs> yeah. Higher power works in uh, mysterious ways, huh? Absolutely. And it's been, it's been great. That is awesome. Si- since then. Since huh. then. It's, um, they've shown, I mean, there's... All sorts of different things you can do in sobriety and have fun and be young. So like, tell me about some of the things that you do and some of the things you've gotten involved in. I know, um, but all the things and, you know, because some people get sober and then they kind of just move on with their life. Sure. You know, and it's like they put it in their past and, you know, they don't walk around. But I mean, that's not the path that you took. You not only got sober, but you got involved. I got involved. Yeah. You know, you're you're an advocate. You go around. You know, um, my understanding is you, you even go around and talk to younger people in schools. Yeah. Tell me about some of the things that you're involved with now um, that you're in long term recovery. Uh, YPR. YPR was huge. <laughs> it was very big for the first like two and a half 
two and a half, about three years in my sobriety. And what's YPR stand YPR for? YPR is Young People in Recovery. So I couldn't be in that? No, young. <laughs> it's young. It just means like you're open-minded. You're willing to grow. Like, you're you, only as old as you act, so exactly. I could. <laughs> All right. So yeah, Young no, People in Recovery. Tell me about it. Young People in Recovery. YPR. It's, um, there's a bunch of chapters. It's, it's, a national, it's a national grassroots advocacy organization. And they are, they try to support those inner seeking recovery, get help at least with housing, employment, and education. So wow. that those who maybe are in long-term treatment, help them get reacclimated to like society and how to learn how to become active members in society. We go to schools and we talk to like, it's, it's like assemblies. We go to school and talk to these kids and like almost every single time I've gone, I've had young kids come up at the end and talk about either their experience or someone they know and they want to know what they can do to, to help. And I'm guessing, I'm guessing the approach isn't kind of like a, a scared straight or a just say no. No, no, it's, it's honesty. You know, like it's, it's our experience is what's happened to us. And like, it's, I try to share with them the red flags that I didn't see, which is like having the weekend instead of being Friday, Saturday, Sunday, have that turn into Monday through Sunday. Right. And like that was my weekend. You know, like I didn't see that as a problem at the time, but it was the fact that I had lost control over my ability to stop drinking like some people do. What are some of the best parts of recovery for you? Tell me about some of the highlights. Um, and also, you know, has your recovery ever been tested? And how did you get through that? Okay. Because life happens. Life does happen. And we got to learn to live life on life's terms. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the high points, I mean, I'm... That's not the I'm, best terminology to use. Tell me about the high points. Yeah, tell me about the high points. <laughs> Well, but the, then I don't want to hear about the low points either. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about how being a young person in long-term recovery is. It's, it is really, it's great. You know, it's gratifying. I have people in my life who care about me today. Not that my, old, my other friends didn't, but I have people who, who show up now. You know, I have, um, I have a really stable job, which I got right in early sobriety. I still have the same job. I'm a supervisor at that job. I'm able to support myself. I have my own apartment. Wow. Um, it's just it's just good being an active member in society, like being able to show up for people, being able to. I I can go to bars today and like not be worried about it. like if there was a not that I really want to, but the fact of the matter is like I don't have to fear where I go. Yeah, you, you know, go like, out to a restaurant. All right. You go to a, a wedding. I mean, mm -hmm. life goes on. You you know, mm -hmm. you stop at stores and get gas, and you walk in, you got to pay for it. There's the beer cooler. <laughs> you know, we yeah. don't have to live in uh, you know a cave anymore. Right. We can we can go out and. We cannot use when we go out. That's a good way to put it. I don't live in fear anymore today. I don't have to live in fear. I can live a spiritual life the way that I understand it. And that's, that's like an altruistic lifestyle. Like I, can, I, I can do the next right thing because it's the next right thing to do. I'm not looking for a pat on the back. I just want to be a good person. You know, I was never a bad person. Yeah. I was a sick person getting well. I, heard, I hear someone say that a lot in, in the uh, program that I'm involved with. Is like, I was never a bad person. Mm-hmm at all who needed to get good i was a sick person who needed to get well and like that's that's exactly what recovery has done for me it's, it's interesting I, I love that you just said i don't have to live in fear anymore because often the topic comes up you know about um you know even for people in long-term recovery about being afraid to relapse and that's still living in fear you know sure. i for myself have have you know developed a great respect for what drugs and alcohol do to me mm -hmm. you know i'm not afraid of relapsing it's like you go to, you know, uh, Six Flags or an amusement park and you've never been on a roller coaster, this roller coaster ever. So you get on, you strapped in, you go up, click, 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 click. Then you get to the top and you come down. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you've experienced that roller coaster. Yeah. So some people are like, that was awesome. I'm hopping back on the roller coaster. And some people are like, no way, I'm, I'm pale white, I'm gonna <laughs> puke. And they never get on it again. Mm -hmm. So like, mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm not afraid to use again right. because I have the respect that I've developed for what cocaine and what alcohol does to me. Yeah, totally. And how can you fear something that you know what it's going to do to you? Right. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like, I know if I go back to using, I can probably almost break down hour by hour what's going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. And I can probably tell you pretty close to the minute on when I'm going to be put in handcuffs. Right. And where right. I'm going to wake up the next day. Exactly. I've, I've found a group of people who know exactly what that means. They've been you know, there, done they've that. Been there, so done now that. you found a, a group of common people that, as opposed to smoking weed, drinking, and listening to music, 
We just live, live, laugh, love. <laughs> you live, know, as laugh, cliche laugh. as that is, like that's just what it's about. I can show up and live life today and I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be ashamed of what happened in the past because I can share that experience with people who may not know where to go next. Right. You know, and like I can show you where to go next. May not be on there. a college campus, somebody no. eavesdropping. That is <laughs> yeah. like awesome and saying, hey, that was amazing. why don't I take you that to a amazing. meeting? What have been some of the challenges you've had in your recovery? How has it been tested? And how have you gotten through that? Because at the end of the day, life still goes on. Mm -hmm. You know, things happen. We, you know, now we have responsibilities that we're conscious of. Mm -hmm. We have to go to work. Our bills have to get paid. Things happen. Our, our, you know, relationships end. Relationships begin. Loved ones die. How has your recovery been challenged and how have you gotten through it? support i've i've lost a lot of I've, I've lost people you know in this in this recovery because some not everyone gets it yeah. and like that's okay you know there's there's financial challenges obviously yeah and there's you know there's there's breakups and there's you know just just emotional bottoms in general which which happen like i'm, I'm a human being and like that's okay but the difference is that like i have the support around me people who understand me who i can reach out to and like get this network together and be like oh you know what guys i'm struggling and like it's okay to ask for help now i'm not it's not weak what is something that you think people that you know don't know as much as we do about substance use disorders and recovery out there need to know like what's one thing that you wish everybody knew about substance use disorders and what do you know it's okay to ask for help i don't know i didn't want to ask for help because i didn't think i had a problem but like, even if you don't think you have a problem, it's, it's okay to just look into it anyway. Like if you even have this like inkling of an idea where it's like, I don't know if I have control over this or- If you're questioning it. If, if you're questioning it at all, just reach your hand out. It's okay. You know, it's, it's not weak to ask for help. And like, that was my thing. It was like, I had a lot of pride and I didn't want to ask for help. I didn't think I needed it. So like from in my experience, like my personal higher power decided to just send someone to ask for help for me kind of thing. But you reach out, ask for somebody. So Jet, this, this is your camera right here. So I want you uh, one last thing to, you know, if someone's out there still sick and still suffering, you know, feeling hopeless, feeling helpless, what would you say to them? Well, I would, I would say it's okay. It's okay to feel scared. It's okay, but there's help out there. There's a lot of help out there. There's different pathways to recovery. And everyone has their own journey, but you know, there's people like myself and hundreds of other people who are willing to help you. All you have to do is ask. Chet, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks.